ES Audio. Now, we don't often put an explicit language warning in front of how to be a CEO, but before we get into this episode, there's going to be some strong language ahead. Parts of this conversation feature robust chat about frustrations and how not everything goes the way you want it. So there's a bit of honest and quite powerful swearing at a couple of points, pretty much from the start. Anyway, on with the show. When you're going into business, it's always good to bring someone along with you. Just one person would help. But 2.1 million, that's like taking a tribe. The most amazing, outspoken, fantastic women. And also they're really like your staunchest champions and they're your harshest critics. So when we do something and they might think, oh, we don't like that. We really think, okay, this is the feedback from the community. So what does that mean for us for product development? We really listen to what they're saying. The Trini tribe on Facebook and Instagram has been a huge part of Trini Woodall's success, building a makeup empire now valued at £200 million. But she didn't start with that number in 2017. In fact, the number some potential investors were more interested in was this one, 51. That's how old she was when the company launched. I did have one or two people who would say occasional comments like, how many years do you think you've got left to run the business? Which I, <laughs> I look back now and I think, are you fucking kidding? I mean, are you kidding? I'm David Wilson from The Evening Standard. Trini's story, like so many other founders, features a lot of barriers. Age, gender, and in this particular one, fashion trends. It had been a while since she was on TV with what not to wear. Fashion's influencer spotlight was looking elsewhere. Determination, then, is a huge factor in anyone's journey to become CEO. And it's something Trini has had for a very long time. It's not the first time I've done it. You know, I started doing my own businesses in parentheses from when I was about 16. So I always had the bug of being an entrepreneur. And the first business I did was a hair bow business. And on my Saturdays, I would go to the market and buy these little jewels. And then I got some people with a partner I did this with in Brixton to make these bows. And we just walked the streets and sold them. We sold them to a few stores, including sort of Harvey Nichols and things. And I did a Saturday job at partridges cutting meat as well. So I used the money from the Saturday job cutting the meats on the deli area. And that went into buying the stock first thing in the morning because I started that job at like 10 a.m. and used to go to the markets at sort of 6 a.m. to, you know, 9 a.m. to get the good stuff at the right price. And I loved it. And then when I left school, the girl I did it with wanted to go to art school and I didn't want to go to university. So I thought I'll just keep this going. And I didn't have the strength at the time to think I could do it by myself. I like the fact that even though I've always generally been the more organised in these partnerships I've had over my years, I like the momentum of not doing something by myself. It's a very different mindset. So I then did, a few years later, a company called Sock It To You. It sold socks. I got girls to sell them in trading floors. I went to Barter, this Eastern European sock company, and made a deal with them. They were not that well made, the socks. There was a bit of backlash in terms of men's socks falling down. But we had about six months of a phenomenal sock run. In between that, actually, I had a shirt pressing business that I also did. And I got girls who also wanted to earn money in sixth form. And we, we charged a pound per shirt. This is in the 82. And then working with Susanna was in a way a self-employment mm -hmm. experience. But it wasn't starting a business. There's a fundamental difference between having a contract where you're a self-employed person and then wondering if that next August that contract will be renewed. So being ready to start this, I, I think I looked at all my failures, my, my dot-com bust in, in 99, 2000, which I learned a tremendous amount from. And what I learned from those of, you know, that, that first experience, I overhired too quickly. I got, I'm going to say I got funded too quickly because that really has an effect if you are well-funded too quickly without having to be a scrappy startup, you don't learn as much. You just don't, because first of all, you hire in experts earlier on. You don't have to learn it yourself because you think I can hire an expert. And so this time, it wasn't the best time to do it. It was the worst time. And I, you know, I hadn't got any future revenue. All my sort of contracts had sort of dried up. My royalties had dried up. And I had to get out of the lifestyle I had because I couldn't afford it. But it was also the time I was 50. And I remember a friend of mine had said to me, when you reach 50, you won't care so much what people think. It will be very freeing. And my 50th year was actually a challenging one because I had some personal challenges. 
But when I reached 51, I had that feeling. I thought, it's now or never and I'm going to do it. It was just like, it was a given. It was so clear to me. Very long-winded answer. No, but what, what I was going to say was there's an awful lot I want to unpack from that. But let's okay. start the most yeah. recent one, which was the, 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 you were 50, 51 when you started this business. Was age a barrier at all for you? It was never a barrier for me because I never define myself. The only time I define myself by age is when I'm looking at the different emotional mindsets of our customer. And I'm looking at sometimes with a predominantly younger team, and they're incredibly good at understanding attitudes of people irrelevant of age. But there are certain moments when we think, what age model should we have that represent what we're doing and we want to have from 18 to 83? I know as a woman in my 50s what I feel for an, a segment of our audience, but I think our team are really great and they, whatever their age, they, they know how people feel who we want to get in touch with and, and tell about the brand. So it was only more of an issue with investors, actually. And I came across some age bias when I was seeking investment of people feeling, first of all, the, the category that I was going after of this plus 35 woman was um, not a great category. And, and what I was doing in tech with personalization was much better for a millennial or a Gen Z. So, you know, why didn't I shift my whole proposition to go after 20 year olds? I did have one or two people who um, just would say occasional comments like, how many years do you think you've got left to run the business? Which I, <laughs> I look back now and I think, are you fucking kidding? I mean, are you kidding? But like, it's there. And, you know, the joke in my team is, is I have more energy than, than my team. It's like there's 200 people in the team, but they always comment on this thing. And I just think it's so ironic that there's some investors saying, but do you think you'll have the energy? And I'm like, oh God, <laughs> really? But anyway, that's, you know, I can look back now in the position I'm in and, and laugh. But at the time, I just thought, please, may I never be in a position of being biased around people's ages. There's so much bias anyway. It's one of the biases we should so easily overcome. But why didn't you then, given it would, might have been a bit easier for you to do what those financiers were suggesting and go for the 20-year-old market, why stick to your guns? Why go, no, it's, it's 35 plus, that's what I'm doing? Because I knew that was the gap in the market. You know, there were so many people going after. There was Glossier, there was Elf Cosmetics, uh, all those brands, which was very much at the time when I launched in 2017. It was that real, you remember this, it was like that real zeitgeist of, you know, churn, churn, many, many new customers. And it was all about the new customer number, creating unicorns, amount of customers. And I always felt I wanted to go after this audience where it would ultimately the judgment would be about retention. And now we are in a market where the judgment on DTC brands, which there will be a lot of people who will not make it through the next couple of two business cycles, it's about your retention. What it meant for us is when we launched, the benchmarks that investors wanted to see of that kind of hockey growth didn't happen in year one and in year two because we were just growing very slowly. We had these cohorts were incredibly loyal, but we just, you know, weren't like getting, you know, 500 new customers a day at that stage. That probably was a very big challenge too of people saying, you know, these people won't go online. And I was thinking, but I'm making something from my experience of all these women I've met around the world who just say how confused they are at the makeup counter. I can actually solve a lot of their problems by persuading them to come online and get matched personally. And that took lots of convincing because that association with a gamification around beauty is so associated with a younger audience and only post-COVID is it associated with that virtual try-on which a lot of traditional beauty brands had to you know catch up with when we went into lockdown for on and off for two years because they had no revenue through retail so they had to kind of get their customer to try things on online and it was a far broader market that was understanding the importance of technology to sell makeup. What I thought was interesting there was how you talked about the strategy of retention mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. what a lot of companies are now doing back yeah. in 2017. Yeah. You're right, it was about charging and get yeah. new one and build, 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 build. But now it's about that slow build up, effectively creating a kind of community around your brand. And that's what you do, isn't it? I mean, you did a lot of work on social media, a lot of work on Instagram, talking directly to potential customers. When you build a business plan, I mean, for anyone who's listening, who's, you know, starting a business, you always think, how do you build out that three to five year plan when you have no revenue yet? What do you base it upon? It's one of the biggest challenges because you overarch 
and people will just won't believe you and you undersell and people won't invest. And it's like you want to give appetite, but you want to have a basis. So I really felt the only true basis I could do is say I have 110,000 followers is what I had there. So I'm going to say 3% of them will buy. And then I'm going to say how many more followers I'll get per month. And I'm going to grow it initially on that social media following because nobody knew the brand Trini London. A few people knew me, bias or non. You know, they, they knew that there was a name awareness. So that is what happened to give us those numbers of where we thought we'd get to. And actually, we hit, you know, for the first three years, we hit exactly what we said we would hit, literally to the letter. So one of the investment companies who invest with us, when they were leaving their company, they said, you're the only person I invest in who actually said exactly this is what it'd be. And it was not, not that's a good or a bad thing, but it was just like that's, that it was a real reality benchmark. And at the beginning of our brand, having that social media presence, albeit small compared to the numbers that we see today, it gave an intimacy. And, you know, when you're talking about beauty, it's a very intimate thing. And you want to be able to have conversations with women that are really personalized and make them connect emotionally. So that helped us a lot to have a point of difference that was different. And at the same time in 2017, when we launched, somebody started a Trini tribe on Facebook that we only discovered in 2018. By the time there were two or three communities around England who had started these sort of fan pages and they'd taken like a little bit of our logo or a picture of me and they were all different and they were all like started by people who just like liked what the conversation was, whether it was conversation that was coming directly from me or from me and then Trini Lander when it launched. So we got in touch and we said, look, you, you're calling yourself the Trini Tribe. Do you want us to make you a little logo? You know, they were all like would have one person who'd be an admin to this community page and then they'd, they'd have to manage it all. So it's so quite a lot of work. These people are very dedicated. So now we have 33 tribes in 16 countries around the world. And they're quite inspiring because predominantly on Facebook, a little bit on Instagram, but Facebook being a two-way social media tool mm-hmm. is a much better place to have a community. And they will be inspired by stuff that's been on Trini London or Trini Woodall. And they will post. And you get many, many people who never post a picture of themselves. You know, the first comment is, it's the first time I've taken a picture of myself in 20 years. And you get these essays and then you get 100 comments of support. I would say maybe, I don't know, between 60 and 70% are our customer. But some of them might never be our customer because they'd like, we're beyond their price range. But it doesn't stop them following and it doesn't stop the growth of that community. And the most important thing with a community when you're a brand, having a community, it should be autonomous to the brand. Like we localized warehousing to Australia. We had 10% of our customer or 15% of our customer in Australia. And we decided to localize warehousing, which is, you know, when you get to a growth level where you do localized distribution, it opens up a whole new aspect to your business. When I went there and I've been there three times, we did tribe events and they all came and activated. You know, I'm on the morning news there a lot when we do things and, and they'll all be in the audience. I mean, they infiltrate through everything and they're coming in. <laughs> You know, it's they're the most amazing, outspoken, fantastic women. And it's it's a privilege we have these women. And also they're really like your staunchest champions and they're your harshest critics. So when we do something and they might think, oh, we don't like that. We really think, OK, this is the feedback from the community. So what does that mean for us for product development? We really listen to what they're saying. And if you're in the Trini tribe or you want to know how it was built, Trini is one of the speakers at our SME Expo event. It's being held on the 25th and 26th of April at Excel London. Tickets are free and there's loads of other speakers there too, like Deborah Meaden and Charlie Mullins. And we'll be recording a live edition of How to Be a CEO with Crept and Sasha, the founders of Nala's Baby, the kids' cosmetics brand. Go to smexpo.co.uk for more details. Come and hang out with us. So obviously a lot of those women are supporting you and supporting your business. Have any of those women taken that step themselves that you know of? Have they gone, do you know what? If Trini can do it, maybe I can. Well, I have this other community and some of them come from the tribe, which I wanted to start to do 
things for female founders on any site. So I started this thing on my own Instagram called The Elevator Pitch. And we started it before lockdown and, and women would come to the office and they get in the elevator with me, literally. It's only a, it's a basement to third floor, all right? So it's a 30 second pitch. And in 30 seconds, they'd pitch the idea and then we put it just on stories. But we had really good traction and we did lots of call to actions at the end of these pitches saying, go and check out the site, go and check out the products. And, and when we had very good conversations and people were very articulate about the challenge they felt, felt about growing a business, we put some of those Q&As on as well. So then last month, International Women's Day for us is a month. All right. And we do a lot for International Women's Month. We do a lot of interviews with people, but we got these women to come. And we had the first Trini London Founders Lab. I just thought, who are going to be the people in our business that will really help them? Because I knew some of these businesses from speaking to them were literally a one man. You know, there's a woman doing incontinence pants from her garage. You know, she knew incontinence was this very difficult thing to talk about and how unappealing incontinence pants were. So from that to somebody who has a really great brand where she's turning over five million. So that real difference. But I can't tell you how much I love that, David, because... If ever I'm in a position where I'm not working my 16 hour day at Trinity London and there's an evolution of myself as CEO, I would then do that. I would try and think, how can I create something that really helps female entrepreneurs to understand everything available to them? Because I say female entrepreneurs because 2% of VC funding went to female entrepreneurs last year. And we know the stat. It's a really terrible stat. I didn't know about SEIS. I didn't know about funding. I didn't know what R&D opportunities can be available to you from the government. The government are not clear in, in the help that is on offer to female entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think that there's still a lot of work that can be done to set something up to really help them. So this is the little acorn of that idea starting. So every female CEO that we've ever had on the show, and we've had a lot of them, has raised that point that funding hasn't been available, advice hasn't been available to them. Has that always been the case though Trini from going back to when you were 16 has it got better or has it got worse when I was 16 the idea of me understanding the government would let me non start a business didn't happen because the bank wasn't going to lend me so that's why I literally took what I was earning and self-funded um on a microscopic level so I think oddly that when I started Trinidad in 2017 and 2015 I got SEIS funding it was easier. Also, the breaks for an entrepreneur were better, the tax breaks. And if they ever wanted to sell some shares, the capital gains tax, you know, they changed everything two years ago. And I think everyone who starts a business, hardly anyone starts a business cash rich. And so, you know, you're putting everything into that business. I put my clothes, I sold my house, I put everything into the, into the business. So if at any stage you're growing the business and you want to take something out. SEIS leans towards giving good tax breaks to high net worth to invest in EIS businesses, which is great. But I think there could be more done. There could be, you know, things like HSBC launched something about female funding. Mm -hmm. But they all appear to be one thing. And then you look under the bonnet and they're really challenging to be a part of. And I think that's the hardest thing is somebody said, oh, I heard this about this company or this bank, you know, focusing on female founders, but then you get into the nitty gritty and it's not always clear. So I think some help could be done there. And how important is it that some of that help at least comes from people like you, from other women, rather than people going to get advice from, you know, the, a bank or some other faceless person, but an actual person who has done this and been there before. I mean, do you have a better understanding of what's people are going through? I think you do because you want, I mean, I, I'm not going to tell you who this was, but you know, there was a situation I found myself in where somebody we had retained in a capacity of an advisor of some sort came and I walked into the meeting and there were seven men sitting there. And um, I said, is someone in the loo? And they went, no, we're all here. And I went, so to a female founder business with 84% women, seven of you come and not one of you is a woman. And they say something about it being difficult to hire in the sector, females or something. And I, I, nearly, <laughs> I nearly thought, let's find other advisors here because it was, just, you know. So there is a lot of work to be done in traditional sectors where there needs to be a little bit more focus on that. 
I'm not saying that I think I would take a woman's advice over a man's. I'll take the best advice. But I think when you're a female founder and you continuously come across in the investment circle or different things, way over indexing in in men, it's quite difficult. And when you're in a, you know, I had been in a few investor meetings where they would just say, you know, let me get my secretary and see if she understands what this idea is. And it's like if I was in a different sector, that wouldn't have been said. And and in a way, it's kind of common sense. Would she use the makeup? You know, and I, I always in that situation put myself and I thought, let's say it was some shaving cream, all right, and somebody was pitching me and, and I'd say, well, I'd need to, I need to get some market research here. Would people use it? But I just don't know if in that meeting, I would think, is it a bit insulting if I call in my male assistant and say, hey, would you use it? Because I'm not clever enough to get whether it's a good business. And I think what it's doing there, if we dissect what that moment's about, it's about not trusting that you as a business person can start a business. It's relying on, you know, one element of a business is obviously it's got to be something that appeals to the market, but you've got to know how to run a business. You've got to know how to grow a team. You've got to know how to learn to delegate all these other things. You've got to know your market share, all these things. So... Yeah, I think it needs to be leveled out. And I just wanted to go like all the way back to the beginning there because it was the way you were talking about things when you were 16, right at the start of this interview. I was just wondering, it's very likely that there's a 16-year-old woman listening to this podcast, thinking about mm-hmm. the opportunities and stuff they have ahead of yeah. them. Is it that different? Clearly the scale's different, the partnerships and complications are different, but is what you did when you were 16 that different to what you're doing now? Um, As a business, a little bit different. I think um, I've got one or two people that I mentor. One of them is actually 20 now, but started the business during lockdown when they were 17, 18. And her drive is the same as mine, but her consistent dedication is stronger than mine then and also her ability to get into a marketplace and be global through social media and TikTok is there and her ability to adapt her proposition and her tone of voice according to what she's picking up in the market is a skill she can learn immediately because the audience she wants to get to is accessible to her through her telephone whereas for me the audience I wanted to get to was so behind the ownership of a department store or behind the ownership of another third party that I would have to always work with an intermediary. And I think the joy of the world we live in today is if you have an idea and you want to do it and there will always be an element of D2C involved, you have the ability to get directly to your customer, which I never had. What's interesting there and what could be perhaps reassuring for people is that you don't have to be Trini off the TV then to be able to access those kinds of audiences now. And also Trini off the TV has pluses and minuses. You know, when I go into anything I do, some people will greet me in the room as the CEO of a business. Some people will say the person who used to present one not to wear. And I think that was 20 something years ago, but okay. I know you have to give context here and it's easy. It's slightly lazy context, but it's easy. And I understand why it's done. So I think Trini off the telly allowed maybe somebody to take a meeting but that was it. And I think if I think of the amount of emails that I sent to potential investors versus how many people I saw, I mean, I must send 120, 130 emails, even more like 200. And then about, you know, every day I'd send 10 emails to all different people, try and help me get somebody to give me an email to somebody who could whatever. Like this jewelry person, for example, they were on an elevator pitch with me. And I thought they're great. And I then said to them, you know, get in touch. And they did get in touch. And they had a whole pitch for me about what percentage of the business they would give me. And I said, look, I don't want any bloody percentage of your business. I will mentor you, but I don't want for you to feel you have to pay me for it. Because my God, I know how difficult it is at the beginning that you give away too much equity. And don't do that to yourself. And I will tell you how much time I can take up. Like I know that first bit that women give away is so much more than what men give away at that very beginning. And their dilution, generally, if you look at female founders, is worse than male dilution. So that needs to be protected tremendously. You know, I have people who send me emails cold. And if they send me one email, sometimes I might never respond, all right? But if they send me an email a week, 
On that third email, I think they're bloody tenacious and I will respond. And sometimes I'm just seeing how tenacious are they. And when somebody like three days later goes, you didn't respond, I really want a response. I'm like, that's so ballsy. <laughs> and I, it makes me respond. So I would say the message here is forget about whether you used to be on the telly and you use that name. If you use funny things in the subject line, and it mustn't sound like a cold caller from a, an ad seller, but if you have that person you want to get in front of, as an investor or whatever, it's just like each week in the subject line when you re repent, say, I know it's week three, but I, I'm not going to let go until you give me any response. You can just tell me to fuck off, but tell me something. You know, and, and I have had one or two people have been really ballsy like that. And those are the ones that I respond to. See, now you just set yourself up to get hundreds of emails. <laughs> I know I have. But, but I think the thing to remember is this. The worst thing that can happen is somebody doesn't respond. And what is that? Nothing. It's like nothing. That was Trini Whittle of Trini London. Go to standard.co.uk forward slash business for more interviews, news and analysis from our top team. How to be a CEO is back on Monday. We'd love to see you then. <laughs>